Good evening. No, this is not going to be another programme all about Halley's Comet, but there is a tremendous amount of interest in it. I made what I think is rather an interesting observation on November the 12th. Using my 15-inch reflector, I made a sketch of the comet. It looked like a fuzz, and there it is. And in the middle, you can see a star-like point. And in point of fact, that is a star shining through the comet, though I didn't realize it at the time. And then, on November the 16th, the comet tracked down near the lovely star cluster of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. And together with John Mason at my observatory, I took this picture. You can see the Pleiades there to the upper left, and there in the middle is the comet. You can see it quite distinctly as a kind of blur. That, I may say, was a 20-minute exposure on a guided camera, of course, and I used a 1,000 ASA film at a very fast lens, and the comet's decidedly brighter now. At least, so I'm told. Of course, since then, in Selsey, I've been completely clouded out. But up in Stoke, Paul Dirty has seen it, and he made this drawing of the comet on December the 2nd. And you can see there the tail is quite obvious. And you can even see indications of the tail on this photograph that Paul took. It's very blown up, but there's the comet in the middle of the picture. And if you look at about two o'clock, reckon it is a clock face, you can just see indications of the tail. Well, people still want to see the comet, so just where is it? It's quite easy to find. This begins with Orion, rising in the southeast. From there, you can find the Pleiades, and over to the right on the diagram, the square of Pegasus. And here is the track of the comet. On November the 15th, 16th, it was uh, near the Pleiades, and I showed you that photograph. And it's now going to track down below the square of Pegasus through Pisces, the fishes, December the 5th, 10th, getting brighter all the time, but of course setting earlier and earlier. And I'm afraid that by mid-January we're going to lose it, and that'll be the last chance we have of seeing it with the naked eye from here. And if you want the very best view of Halley's Comet this time around, well, you've got to wait till the first week in April, and then I'm afraid go south to Australia, South Africa, or somewhere like that. So now, two other things. Astronomers get more right than they get wrong, but they do make mistakes. Sometimes everybody makes a mistake, sometimes only a few do. And uh, I thought it might be rather interesting this evening just to have a look back over the years and see where we've gone wrong. And in many cases, frankly, we have. So let's begin with our nearest neighbor, the moon. And here's a picture of one of the so-called lunar seas. That's the Marian Ectris. That's a photograph I took myself with my 15-inch telescope a little while ago. You can see there the great bay of Fracastorius, 75 miles across. We've known for a long time that there's no water on the moon, and there never has been. But it was suggested by Dr. Thomas Gold in the mid-1950s that the lunar seas were made up of soft dust, so that any spacecraft landing there would simply sink out of sight permanently into a deep dust ocean. And if that had been correct, then landing on the moon would have been, well, frankly, well-nigh impossible. And that theory was taken very seriously, particularly in the United States. Frankly, I never believed it. It didn't seem to fit the facts. But it wasn't finally disproved until the mid-1960s, when automatic craft landed there, followed, of course, in 1969 by the moon men. And I'm sure you recognize there that famous picture of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin standing on the lunar surface with no tendency whatsoever to sink down into dust. Then what about the planets? And one mystery concerned Venus, which is closer to the sun than we are, and is permanently hidden by a dense, cloudy atmosphere. And we can't see through the atmosphere. And uh, before the space age, we didn't know a great deal about Venus, although we did know from spectroscopic analysis that the atmosphere contains a great deal of the heavy gas carbon dioxide. But what was the surface like? According to two great American astronomers, Whipple and Menzel, Venus was almost entirely covered with water. So there'd be a planet-wide ocean, and the scene would look something like that. And of course, since the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would have got into the water and fouled it, you would have had oceans of soda water, and there seemed no reason why not. And there was another interesting point there, too, because a long time ago, in its early stages, the Earth's atmosphere had very much more carbon dioxide than it has now, and less free oxygen. The Earth was warmer, and life began in the oceans. And if Venus had been like that, then why should not life just be starting there now, and why shouldn't it evolve just as it's done here? It all looked very nice, but sadly, it's completely wrong. The space probes told us straight away that the surface temperature is much, much too high, nearly 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and you can't have water in that in under those conditions. And we now believe that Venus is a raging dust desert with active volcanoes, and this may be very much more the scene very like the conventional picture of hell, and totally unlike the lovely watery planet pictured not so long ago by Whipple and Menzel. And then what about Mars, the most Earth-like planet? 
Here's one of the best Earth-taken pictures of Mars, showing the red deserts, the dark areas, and the polar caps. And we believe that the red areas were deserts, that the dark areas were old seabeds filled with vegetation or some kind of organic material, and that the polar caps were very thin deposits of frost, possibly no more than a quarter of an inch deep. That's what we thought. We also believe that the surface was fairly smooth, and we thought that the atmosphere had a ground pressure of something like 85 millibars, which is roughly the same as the pressure in our air at twice the height of Mount Everest. That's what we thought. Of course, astronomers had drawn these strange things called canals. And there's an old drawing of the canals of Mars made by Percival Lowell, who believed Mars to be inhabited, and he thought those canals were artificial waterways. But for a long time, though, we've known that that's not so. And in point of fact, we have found out long since that those canals just don't exist in any form. They are simply tricks of the eye. But in many other respects, we were wrong. To start with, Mars is not smooth. There are volcanoes, there are craters. Look at that. That's a picture sent back from the Viking probe, and that's a fairly typical piece of Martian scenery. And then, above all, we were wrong about those dark areas. Here's a picture showing Mars uh, by the Viking probe on its way there in the mid-1970s. Those blobs are huge volcanoes. You can see the polar cap over to the left, and there are some of the dark areas. But most of them are not depressions, some of them are plateaus, and they are certainly not covered with organic material. They are simply merely areas where the red dust has been blown away by Martian winds, leaving the ground below exposed. So there's no question of there being due to vegetation. And we were also wrong about the polar caps. We thought they were made up of a very thin layer of frost. In point of fact, they're very deep indeed, and they're a mixture of carbon dioxide ice and water ice. And then the atmosphere. Another mistake. The ground pressure is very low, less than 10 millibars everywhere, and the atmosphere is made up chiefly of carbon dioxide. And then what about Martian life? We believed fairly conclusively that those dark areas were organic, and therefore we expected to find traces of life on Mars. And when the Vikings went there, they scooped up soil from the deserts, they drew it in, they analyzed it, and they sent back the results. And although the results are a bit confusing, they don't show any traces of life. And I think most people, including me, are coming to the rather reluctant conclusion that at the moment, anyway, there isn't any life on Mars. There was one rather amusing sidelight. Mars had got two tiny moons, Phobos and Deimos, both less than 30 miles across. And in the late 1950s, a very famous Russian astronomer, Joseph Shkovsky, made the statement that, in his view, Phobos and Deimos were not genuine satellites, but artificial space stations. Well, I don't think many people took that very seriously. I mean, now I know, of course, it certainly is not true. Here is Phobos, photographed from space. It's merely a chunk of rocky material and irregularly cratered. And uh, not long before he died last year, Shklovsky actually told me that that statement was made as a practical joke. Well, I don't know. Then what about Mercury, the innermost planet? There also we made a serious mistake. Mercury goes round the sun once in 88 Earth days. And we believe that it span on its axis in exactly the same time. And if so, then it would keep the same face to the sun all the time, just as the moon does to the Earth. And on Mercury, there'd be an area of permanent day, an area of permanent night, and a kind of narrow twilight zone in between. And science fiction writers made great play of that twilight zone. Well, again, we are completely wrong. These space probes that were sent back pictures of the Mercurian surface showing craters and mountains, and also radar, have demonstrated that the rotation period is not 88 days, it's only 58 and a half days. So there's no permanent day zone, no region of permanent sight, and also no twilight zone. And that was really a bad mistake. Beyond the inner planets, we come to giant Jupiter with a gaseous surface. And there on that Earth-taken picture, to the upper left, you can see the famous great red spot. And we believed that that was a solid or semi-solid body floating in Jupiter's outer gas. Now, I remember doing a Sky at Night program with that theory, oh, 25 years ago now. Well, again, the space probes have shown otherwise. And here's a Voyager picture of the great red spot, which is nothing more nor less than a whirling storm, a phenomenon of Jovian weather. And you can see the structure there very clearly indeed. Of Jupiter's four big satellites, one of them, Io, has turned out to be most unexpected. And there's a Voyager picture of it. And it uh, looks rather like an Italian pizza, doesn't it? The surface is red. That's because it's covered with sulfur, and there are violently active volcanoes there. And no one had the slightest idea that Io could be like that. We thought it was going to turn out to be icy and cratered. Nothing could be further from the truth. I suppose the loveliest object in the entire sky is Saturn, when the rings are open, particularly as they are at the moment. 
and we believe that those rings are made up of icy particles, which is true, and we thought that there were two main rings separated by a black right line or gap known as the Cassini division. And we thought the rings would be, well, fairly straightforward. But again, Voyager has shown that they are not. Just look at this. And there's a picture of Saturn's ring system from close range. There are thousands of narrow ringlets and tiny divisions. And just why the rings are like that? Well, we're not sure even now, but certainly they were totally unlike anything we'd expected. And even in Saturn's satellite family, there was one major surprise. The biggest of Saturn's moons is Titan, bigger than our moon. And we'd known that Titan had an atmosphere. But we thought that atmosphere was rather thin and made up chiefly of the gas methane. Again, Voyager showed us wrong. The atmosphere is dense, the ground pressure is one and a half times the pressure of the Earth's air at sea level, and the main constituent is nitrogen, which of course makes up 78% of the air that you and I are breathing. And in fact, we still don't know what lies below those clouds, but here's an impression by Paul Doherty, which may show you what Titan is like. You can even see Saturn shining down dimly through the clouds to the upper left. And there may well be cliffs of solid methane, rivers of liquid methane, and a methane rain dripping down all the time from the orange clouds in the nitrogen sky. A fascinating world, and I can't wait to find out more about it, although I'm afraid that's going to be delayed until we have a special probe to go there and find out. Well, therefore, we made many mistakes in the solar system. What about the stellar system, the stars? There were two major errors there, both of which go back some way. And I think I must start with what's known as the HR, or Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, named after the two astronomers who drew it up uh, shortly before the First World War. And there the stars are plotted according to their luminosities compared with the sun, that's on the left-hand side, and their surface temperatures running along the bottom. Those letters at the top indicate spectral types that needn't concern us at the moment. Well, you can see where we put in various stars. The sun's near the middle. That has a surface temperature of just below 6,000 degrees, and of course the luminosity is one because we are making it so. And you can see other stars there, Sirius, Vega, Antares, Arcturus, and so on. And that colored line indicates what we call the main sequence, running from top left, where the stars are very luminous and blue or white, down to lower right, where they're dim and red. And that's called the main sequence. Now we thought, uh, correctly, that this was linked with stellar evolution, but the original ideas were completely wrong. We believe that the star began by condensing out of a cloud of gas and dust known as a nebula. And that's true enough, and there are many nebulae visible. There's one below the belt of Orion, and there it is, the famous Orion Nebula, and that is undoubtedly a stellar birthplace. So a star begins like that. Now let's look at what we thought happened. The star began by condensing and became cool, large, and red. Then, by gravity, it heated up and became smaller and more luminous. It joined the main sequence, top left, and then, as its energy waned, it slid down the main sequence, went yellow, orange, red, and finally dying away as a very dim red dwarf. That's what we thought happened. Very nice and completely wrong. There is an evolutionary sequence there, but it's not that. So let's now see what really happens. The star does begin by condensing out of a nebula, and it then shrinks and joins the main sequence. And then it stays there for most of its active life until it runs out of fuel. And it then swells out to become a red giant. And then when all the nuclear processes are exhausted, it simply collapses and ends up as a very small, very dense, bankrupt star of a kind known as a white dwarf. And that's going to be the eventual fate of the sun. I realize that's very oversimplified, but it does give the general idea. Now, the other mistake concerned things like this. And here is the Andromeda spiral. You can see quite nicely with binoculars and even glimpse with the naked eye. It's not far from the square of Pegasus. Just exactly what is it? It was known as a spiral nebula. And the great astronomer Harlow Shapley, who joined me on a Sky at Night program many years ago now, sadly he's died since then, he believed that that and things like it were small features of our own Milky Way galaxy. He set out to measure the size of the Milky Way, and he did that by studying stars in what are called globular clusters. And here's the globular cluster, that's the one in Hercules, and as you can see, it contains many stars, something like a million. Now, some of those stars are variable, and they give away their distances by the way in which they behave. Shapley studied those stars, found out their distances, and found out the distances, therefore, of the globular clusters in which they lay. And since the globular clusters lie around the edge of our Milky Way system, he was able to tell how big the Milky Way is, and he got it right. But he was completely wrong about the so-called spiral nebulae. Look at this one. 
This is the whirlpool in the hunting dogs, and that has a Catherine wheel form. And Shapley was convinced that this was a minor feature of our own galaxy. And there was a famous debate in 1920 between Shapley on one side and uh, Heber Curtis on the other. And uh, in this respect, Shapley was wrong, although he was right about the actual size of our own galaxy. How could we find out? Well, it was tackled by Edwin Hubble using the 100-inch Mount Wilson reflector. And there's a picture of the 100-inch telescope that I took when we did a sky at night from there a couple of years ago now. And very sadly, that's now been put out of commission. But for a long time, it was very much the largest and the most powerful telescope in the entire world. And Hubble used it in the early 1920s to study features such as the Andromeda spiral and the whirlpool. And he was looking for these variable stars. And he found them. And having found them, he could find out their distances. And straight away, he realized they were so far away, they could not possibly be in our own Milky Way galaxy. And therefore, the spirals were themselves external systems. And he gave the distance of the Andromeda spiral as 750,000 light years. Now, that, of course, is a long way. It means we'd be seeing the spiral as it used to be 750,000 years ago. And it did indicate, however, that it was well beyond our own Milky Way galaxy. And that was a major step forward. But again, there was a serious error that didn't come to light until many years later, actually in 1952. And it was due to the work of the American astronomer Walter Bader. And he was using the Palomar 200-inch reflector. And there's a picture of the 200-inch, which is still the largest really effective telescope in the world. There is one larger, the Russian 236-inch, which frankly it doesn't work very well. The Palomar one does. Now, the Palomar telescope was far more powerful than the Mount Wilson. And Bader used that to study these variable stars in the spirals and other external systems. And he found out there had been a major error because the Cepheid variable scale was wrong. The variable stars were twice as luminous as anyone had thought. And because they were twice as luminous, they were also twice as far away. And therefore, instead of being less than a million light years distance, the Andromeda spiral was over two million light years away. And we now know that is correct. There had been a trifling error of something like 100%. And I remember that well. It was read, uh, the, the result was announced by Bader at a meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1952. And in one short 20-minute paper, he very calmly doubled the size of the universe. And uh, I think it was a stunned silence afterwards. I remember it very well because I was, in fact, there. So, you see, we have made mistakes, quite excusable ones, although the progress of astronomy over the last few decades has been quite amazingly rapid. So where do we go next? And there may be one other object about which we have been very largely wrong, and that is the planet Uranus. Now, Uranus is the first planet to be discovered beyond Saturn, found by Herschel in 1781, and here is the latest picture of it, and that was taken by the Voyager 2 probe that is now on its way there. It was launched in 1977, and it should bypass Uranus on January the 24th next year. Now, that picture, the first really good one, was taken when the Voyager was 150 million miles away from Uranus. And we expected to see weather patterns and clouds. And we don't, and we are still not. For some reason, Uranus is featureless. And therefore, we could be completely wrong about that too. But we shall find out, because next January, when Voyager 2 goes past, we are doing a special program from JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, in Pasadena, California. And then we should be able to give you the answers. But Uranus, I'm sure, holds many surprises for us. So. I don't want to give the wrong impression. We've got far more right than we got wrong, but of course astronomers are only human and they do make mistakes. Well, this is our last program of 1985, and so before I go, may I wish you all very sincerely a happy Christmas and a very happy new year. Until 1986, goodbye. Well, in case you didn't quite keep up with all those theories, there's another look at those mistakes on BBC Two next Saturday afternoon at 10 to 2.